Hey, this is Jonathan. I'm the student pastor here at Hampstead, and Pastor Joey asked me to do this week's Powered for Grace. And it's on Advent and specifically about the week of peace in Advent. Um, in Hebrew, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Um, the word for peace is shalom, and many of you probably already knew that. But shalom doesn't merely signify the absence of conflict, but it also encompasses so much more than that, like wholeness and completeness and well-being. And in the Old Testament, shalom, uh, and even today still, uh, it's not just a word or an emotion, but it's a common greeting. Uh, it still is in many cultures today that they wish uh, peace for the people with whom they're speaking. Uh, and shalom refers to relationships between people and between nations and God with men. And many times it's associated with a covenant or a promise kept. Uh, but peace is directly related to our choices with regard to our actions and our attitudes. We choose peace despite the circumstances that surround us. It's ultimately a gift from God. It's a fruit of the Spirit who indwells believers. And this presence of peace indicates God's blessing on man's obedience and faith. And as it says in Isaiah, in Isaiah, there is no peace for the wicked. And peace is an important element of what God wants for his people. And if you do a quick search for peace and a concordance, uh, you'll find that it's used somewhere between 263 to 429 times, depending on the translation that you've chosen. And I know that that's a pretty big variant there. I've uh, been in the NIV, for instance, uh, it uses English words like safety and silence and quiet rest and stillness, treaty, satisfy, ease, fellowship, and things like that instead of the word peace, um, like in the King James Version. It, in its various contexts to better reflect the intended meaning, making better sense in English, but Anyway, around it, 263 times, 429 times, or in everywhere in between, peace is an important part of Scripture in both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, I actually read this passage this morning in my devotional time, and I thought, wow, like that goes really well with what Joey asked me to talk about, so I'm going to use that today. <laughs> uh, it's from Psalm 85, um, verses 7 through 11, and it says, Show us... Your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones, but not let them return back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. And there's so much that could be said about that, so much. Um, but this is a video devotional. It's not, a, um, it's not a, an academic paper or a book. But I do want to say just a few quick things about it. Uh, in verse 7, if you want to go back and look it up and kind of go along with me as I offer a few thoughts, Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. He did exactly that at Christmas time. And he made this possible beginning with what he did at Christmas time. He made his salvation possible. And in verse 8, I will hear. And then other translations say, will listen. I will listen. And this shows a willingness to pay him mind. And when we do, we are sure to hear what he will say. And we see that in the next verse that he will say. We're sure to hear what he says and he's sure to speak. And in verse nine in verse nine, salvation is near, and we can have peace in that knowledge, knowing that salvation is near. And in verse ten, his loving kindness to take care of the truth of the matter. So the penalty was due for humanity's sin, and that's evident that one isn't um it's evident that one isn't mutually exclusive of the other. The truth is that we deserve punishment, 
but because of his loving kindness, he chose to take that punishment on himself. So it's a both and. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. I thought that was really interesting language, but there's that word again about peace. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So it seems here that the righteousness and peace are not only desirable, but relationally connected with one another. The psalmist here seems to be in an advent of his own. He's waiting. This passage seems to point so clearly to the realized promise of Christ that we celebrate at Christmas. And because of Christmas, God's plan was spun into motion in time uh, for his righteousness to make his peace possible for his children. So during Advent, let's remember these three things about peace. Jesus came for the glory of God to offer us his righteousness. Also, Jesus came to give his people peace. He's called the Prince of Peace, among many other things. Um, Jesus said himself in John 14, in verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So Jesus came to give his people peace. His righteousness, his peace, and Jesus and his people can live in fellowship both now and forever. We don't have to wait till we die. We begin that fellowship with him the moment we first believe. We can live in fellowship with him now and forever because of this righteousness and peace. And I could say so much more about this and could indeed write quite a lengthy devotion about it, a paper, a book. But let me conclude with a quote from a pastor named Greg McKinney. So today, listen in and let your love and faithfulness meet with his. And let your display of his righteousness allow you to be kissed with his peace. Then and only then can we spread it. Thank you.